Welcome back. We're just over two weeks into Women's Month. Research from the 14th edition of the Women's Report shows that more than half of female health burdens occur during their working age years. Targeted support for women's health needs can therefore help lift a company's bottom line and overall economic growth. In the meantime, global GDP is estimated to grow by $1 trillion by 2040 if the women's health gap is tackled. Anita Bosch, a researcher chair of women at work from the Stellenbosch Business School, uh, joins us with more insight. Thank you so much for your time, Professor. Now, the report is saying that targeting women's health can boost the economy, but can companies not see the cost of not targeting women's health on their bottom line? Well, Zanati, I think uh, it's important to um, remember that employers are not really yet used to many women in the workplace. Okay. And so often what happens is policies are written for those that are there mm. and um, employers may not even go back to those policies and review them. Um, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that women and men are different in many ways. Um, it does not mean they're lesser or better, but they are different. And so for any employer that's interested in getting the best out of their people, they really do need to look into their policies and ask how it might affect different groupings of people in different ways. Elisa, let's talk about then this health gap, you know, uh, and what we we're trying to respond to here. When we make mention of that, what exactly are we talking about? So the health gap really looks at um, uh, the efficacy of um, medicines and treatments. In other words, whether women and men uh, react in the same way to um, treatment, and we know that they don't. And that many treatments, uh, many of the, the treatment protocols are written for men. It also looks at the data that's available on women and their health. And what, we, um, what we've also seen is that um, uh, we really have very, very little data on, on women's specific conditions, but then also how women uh, react uh, to uh, generic conditions that um, both women and men, that they're not sex specific conditions. Uh, and then overall, just research that gets done um, on, on that and how we can improve um, women's health overall. How then should companies respond to this? Uh, you talk about, you know, women reacting differently to medicines and treatment, but also, um, you know, uh, health conditions occurring more when it comes to women rather than men uh, in their working age. How do companies navigate that, but also the need for productivity? Um, I think the important thing is that productivity will be affected by, um, by uh, poor health conditions, but it doesn't mean that a woman is unproductive. Mm. Um, and so um, often what happens is just for women to understand their bodies, to understand more about how they function. And that's why the Women's Report, which is available for free download at womensreport.africa, is an important resource for women to understand their bodies and communicate better. Um, there's also the understanding that um, for every human being in the workplace, they cannot be 100% productive every single day. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen um, in, in workplaces, as more women enter and, and demand different ways of being treated, um, uh, you know, for instance, greater levels of flexibility and so forth, it improves the workplace for both women and men. And so as we make uh, other demands, bring under the attention of employers what it is that we need, um, there's a, a, a shift that often occurs. Um, and only for those employers that are not really interested in inviting uh, great talent into their workplace do they ignore those, those requests. I also want to speak about resistance here, Anita, because, um, of course, uh, we know we've spoken about the fact that it actually hasn't been that long that women have been allowed into the mainstream economy to take up space and to take up positions. But I also uh, believe that there is a form of resistance here, uh, you know, where it's, it's, it's kind of like when you start to speak about these issues of reproductive health and women's health, then you are met with some form of pushback. Are we able to understand that psyche? Uh, you know, why uh, with all the science and all the data presented to us, we're just resisting uh, the acceleration of these policies and this engagement? I think it um, stems, it's a great question, but I think, I think it stems back uh, to the I ideal that we hold. So if we think about workplaces, what most employers think about is this ideal worker, the person that is disembodied, in other words, I can't get sick, 
They don't have any care obligations. That means it's not any woman, but there are many men that also have very deep care um, considerations for people and that they are available 24 seven. And when we hold this ideal of an employee, we really are talking about robots. But mm. often this ideal is applied to men um, because uh, in the past it was said that there's somebody at home, whomever that would be, or in the greater community that will take care of care. Um, and so men are then not given the opportunity to participate in care. And when we hold this ideal about people in the workplace, then what we're expecting of um, any person stepping into a role is to be available 24-7, never get sick and have no care obligations. Now, um, I think it is up to us uh, then um, as uh, activists and, and to think about how we can start bringing this under the attention of employers. This is very much what the chair is about and the research that we bring out. Um, so that employers can understand that the ideology that we hold about employees is, is how we eventually treat them and what we get to expect about, um, from them. And no man even can hold up you know, uh, to, that, to that way of working. In fact, we get high levels of burnout and eventually um, very unproductive people, although they are present at work. I need to understand that today we're zooming into the healthcare factor, but I mean, is there an appreciation that a woman centered healthcare policy cannot work alone, that it needs the support of other policies, including an increase in female management and better compensation for female employees to actually be able to afford comprehensive healthcare? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the important thing is our country is really in a dilemma with regards to unemployment in general. Mm -hmm. um, so for both women and men, it's really, really bad. What we do see is that there are more women that start up informal um, employment opportunities that remain then in that informal employment because of childcare obligations. So uh, with regards to a, a systemic approach, it absolutely has to happen. You're spot on there. Because, uh, for instance, if a woman doesn't have access to contraceptive care, um, she's going to have more children just by virtue of being um, uh, fertile. And that burden then falls onto her. Um, we're seeing all more and more that um, the you know, younger women are just stepping into the poverty trap because of that. Um, and so there has to be a combination between healthcare, um, job uh, security, uh, the increases in available jobs we've, we've seen in the first quarter, which we see every year in the quarter, quarterly labor force survey, that there were 330,000 peop more people that were unemployed. Um, and so that cycle cannot continue. So our government must place emphasis on job creation and job creation doesn't mean that the government should create it. It means the support of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial ideas, mm. and creating a level playing field for everybody to step into that and actually employ other people uh, and encourage that. Brilliant. All right, this is all we have time for today. I'd like to thank you so much for your time today and shedding light on this very important topic. That was uh, Anita Bosch, Research Chair of Women at Work from the Stellenbosch Business School.